Now, I have the honor of introducing our Alonzo plenary speaker, Dr. Joyce Slockauer. Dr. Joyce Slockauer is a prof professor emerita of psychology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. She is faculty and supervisor at NYU postdoctoral program, Stephen Mitchell Center, National Training Program of the National Institute for the, Psych for the Psychotherapies, Philadelphia Center for Relational Studies, and the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California in San Francisco. Dr. Slockauer is on several editorial boards. She's published over 80 articles on various aspects of psychoanalytic theory and technique. Second editions of her two books, Holding and Psychoanalysis, A Relational Perspective, as well as Psychoanalytic Collisions, were released in 2014. She's in private practice in New York City, where she sees individuals and couples and runs supervision and study groups. This commentary was made about her book, Psychoanalytic Collisions. In this beautiful work of reflection and self-reflection, Joyce Slockauer wrestles with the seldom acknowledged dimension of being a psychoanalyst, the dialectic between illusions and less ideal realities that complicate the analyst's sense of who she is and of how best to meet her clinical obligations. Psychoanalytic collisions details the various ways in which the analyst wishes, both professional and personal, collide with the less than perfect actualities of everyday clinical work. In her 2013 article, Psychoanalytic Mommies and Psychoanalytic Babies, A Long View, she expands the notion of a holding environment, and I quote, our ideal represents our wish and also often our need to heal, to change, to engage, to do something useful. Of course, our personhood limits our capacity to meet that ideal and confronts us with what I've called a psychoanalytic collision. This description leaves me wanting to hear more about her work and her perspective. And I'm deeply pleased that we will have the opportunity to hear her reflections and self-reflections on trying not to look ahead. Welcome, Dr. Slockauer. I know you're all expecting that I'm going to say something brilliant today about group therapy, but I'm not a group therapist, and I would not dream of venturing there. Still, I think my topic applies as much to group therapists as it does to psychoanalysts. I'm stopping for a second. Are you hearing the feedback? Yeah. Can, you're not hearing the feedback? OK. All right, I just have to talk through myself then. Our topic applies at least to all of us over 45. So I ask your indulgence and hope that you'll find this useful. My patient Sam is divorced in his late 40s. He speaks of his feelings about me, feelings that range from warm affection to anger. He also talks about sexual desire and erotic fantasies. Sam's fantasies are mostly organized around an attractive female colleague. I listen for transference illusions, however indirect, for desire aimed my way, but I've yet to hear any. Sam's erotic fantasies, veiled or not, are not about me. Damn. <laughs> Feminism notwithstanding, it's painful to feel physically invisible. Of course, when I was younger and there was heat in the consulting room, that wasn't always easy either. I felt all kinds of things when my patients expressed sexual wishes toward me, desire, self-consciousness, anxiety. 
I tried to remain aware of the inadvertent seductive element embedded in transference exploration. There were days when I was careful to avoid wearing low-cut tops and short skirts. No more. <laughs> and I spent a whole lot of money on this blouse, I want to say. <laughs> These days, blouse notwithstanding, I feel as sexually invisible to Sam as I am to the construction workers who whistled at my 20-year-old self. Then I hated being objectified, but I hate being unseen just as much. It's a big narcissistic injury. My young patients see me not as an object of sexual desire, but instead as a sort of cool version of their mother, sometimes even their grandmother. But they're wont to say things like, do you know about st uh, streaming music? Have you ever heard of Instagram? <laughs> I tend to feel mildly insulted by these questions. And I deal with them badly, I think. I joke, reassure them that I've indeed encountered the internet. <laughs> of course, sometimes I'm confronted with something I really don't know, something that dates me. And then I feel slightly <laughs> rattled. On one hand, I actually am and love being a grandma. I didn't even mind too much when, last week, my five-year-old grandson asked me why the skin on my neck was, quote, crinkly. <laughs> I didn't mind much because I adore him, not because I like my old neck. On the other hand, I live in a partially fantasized younger version of myself and my body. Not only do I not feel old, I'm surprised and offended when given a seat on the subway. When someone tries to set me up with a 75-year-old man. Like, what? <laughs> I don't identify at all with Simon and Garfunkel's old friends who, quote, sat on a park bench like bookends. After all, in the past two years, I've hiked the Atlas Mountains, the Dolomites, and the French Alps. In summer, thank you. In summer, I regularly bike 25 miles. And I can leg press 225 pounds. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, I am showing off. <laughs> I collect comments about how fit I am with something close to glee. Those comments seem to negate the fact that, fit or not, I'm getting old. So is all this an adaptive version of the manic defense? A problematic one? Probably both. Still, I think that denial as a defense is underrated. <laughs> as I write this, I'm also acutely aware that 68, which is my age for the moment, is not 88 or 98 that I'm far from done aging, that to my oldest colleagues, I'm still on the young side. So I write this as a younger old person who's now confronting getting really old for the first time. I began writing about aging nearly two years ago while in the Berkshires with good friends, Nancy McWilliams and her husband. Anticipating a challenging hike up a mountain while they took the sedate lake route, I felt like Tarzan. But then, in February 2017, a freak accident, <coughs> and I underscore defensively, an accident that was not my fault, shattered that illusion. A sticky boot sole stuck to the floor, and I fell hard on my kneecap. After a brief period of manic denial, I was sure it wasn't broken. I went to my grandson's preschool to pick him up. I took him to his music class, I hobbled home, I called my friend to say, no worries, we are going to Turks tomorrow, uh, hobbled back to my office to see a study group. But midway through that group, reality broke through. I was in acute pain. I told the group what had happened, and they, with utter graciousness and care, helped me downstairs and into a cab that took me to urgent care. Yes, the patella had fractured. I not only had to cancel my trip, but my patients and groups as well. In a straight leg brace for months, in considerable pain, unable to turn over in bed or walk easily, no less run or bike, 
the manic, the manic defense collapsed and I got depressed. And though I was back at work the following week, my leg was an elephant in the room. To a person, my patients and groups were kind and solicitous. But beneath all this, there was more, of course. I gradually learned how varied and complex were some individual patients and group members' reactions to my injury. Concern, distress, annoyance, and for one person, the re-evocation of a trauma. At first, flooded by a kind of PTSD, triggered by this overwhelming helplessness, I was in no position to work with their responses. But as the early weeks passed, I refound my analytic self. I also turned back to denial. I, I use denial a lot. <laughs> I walked more than I should. I was determined not to let my muscles atrophy. I paid for that, prolonging the recovery period. Still, two months later, I was hiking in New Zealand, vulnerable no longer, for now. Analytic process outside time. There's something so utterly timeless about analytic process that it can be engaged to perpetuate an illusion of timeless intactness. We enter this work convinced that we'll be there to see it through. Our investment in our therapeutic capacity is such that it's extraordinarily difficult to contemplate the loss of that capacity. I think this is true despite the fact that we identify the analyst's emotional vulnerability as core to therapeutic efficacy. We psychoanalysts have mostly been silent on the subject of aging as it breaks into this illusion of timelessness. We've sidestepped the reality that helplessness and need will infiltrate our lives as we age. We know, but only intellectually, that the day will likely come when we won't be functioning as we do now, when we'll need help of one kind or another. Our sense of therapeutic agency and competence buffers what we know. Many of us ignore, deny, disavow the loss of capacity, whether physical or cognitive, that's likely to surface down the road. It's as if adults aren't vulnerable, only babies. Winnicott, for example, spoke about the baby's need for a sustained sense of what he called going on being. Continuity of self exists only when massive impingements don't repeatedly disrupt. Impingements bring with them a threat of annihilation, but only for babies or in instances of acute adult trauma. Neither Winnicott nor Melanie Klein considered our adult vulnerability to the real end of our going on being. Few of our psychoanalytic ancestors took up the question of how we deal with our own endings. Marty Fromer eloquently describes the history of early analysts, including Freud, Akhtar, and Eisler's failure to contend with mortality. It's as if, once we've matured and developed a solid sense of ourselves, we expect to deal easily with the deterioration and ultimately the loss of that very self. We idealize maturity, envision the equanimity with which we should face our own end. We assume that, if we're psychologically healthy, we'll manage our aging without rigidifying, becoming self-centered, no matter despairing. That we'll grow old and move toward Eric Erickson's generativity and ego integrity. That nurturing the next generation will be enough. Toward the end of his life, Eric Erickson, in, co in collaboration with his wife Joan, added a ninth stage to his developmental eight ages of man model. This last stage addressed the challenges of old age. It, like his eighth stage, is organized around the tension between integrity, wisdom, and despair. But despair looms larger toward the end of life as we confront physical and cognitive deterioration and revisit all previous developmental stages. I'm going to quote from him briefly. Epigenetically speaking, then, we can say that all the later age-specific developments are grounded or rooted in the strengths developed in infancy, childhood, and adolescence. And if the sense of autonomy naturally, in quotes, suffers grievously in old age, as the leeway of independence is, is constricted, 
there can also mature an active acceptance of appropriate limitations and a wise choice of involvements in vital engagements of a kind not possible earlier in life. Here, the Ericsson's name what was sidestepped in the earlier Eight Ages model, the often overwhelming horror that aging and the prospect of death evoke. They provide us with an ideal worth aiming for, namely, the wisdom and integrity with which to contemplate our own ending. But they also imply that we can use our wisdom to evade and manage the losses that old age brings with it. Can we? Is it really possible to encompass the actuality of our growing irrelevance, the loss of ourselves, the terror and deep grief connected with absence and absent connections to loved ones? I think not. No matter how realistically we accept the reality of our own progressive incapacity and ultimately our death. A friend told me about such a moment of terror. He's 72, in good health, aware only of the minor cognitive slips many of us complain about. Then, at the end of a long and exhausting day, he opened his office door to invite his last patient in, only to realize that he had absolutely no access to her name. This was not a new patient either. Such a thing had never happened to him before, and he called me later in a panic. Is this the beginning of Alzheimer's, of dementia, is it merely the sign of fatigue? I wanted desperately to reassure him, and implicitly, of course, to reassure myself, but I really didn't know. If we're lucky, aging will precede death by decades, decades that help us hold on to denial. If something breaks into our denial, it's usually illness. There's been a lot of excellent writing on illness in The Therapist by, for example, Friedman, Andy Morrison, Barbara and Stuart Pizer, Nancy Kahn, and others. They movingly describe the impact of the analyst's physical vulnerability on therapeutic process. But physical illness represents a break in our ordinary going on being. Aging does not. It's expected, it's part of life, but it's a part we work energetically to ignore. In earlier psychoanalytic times, many analysts felt obligated to maintain therapeutic neutrality even when it involved an active negation of reality. Decades ago, my friend's analyst, somebody you may have heard of, Doris Bernstein, maybe not, from New York, um, continued working as lung cancer decimated her. Despite the fact that she moved a hospital bed into the consulting room, she never acknowledged her illness to her patients. My friend knew she was not to say anything about what she saw, and so her analyst's death arrived un unacknowledged and unprocessed. I'm just gonna interrupt myself here to say what I can't stop thinking about, so I might as well say it. Many of you may have heard of Lou Aaron. Yeah. Um, Lou died yesterday. Um, we were, we were dear friends. Um, I had seen him just the day before. Lou represented the antithesis to this. He owned, he owned and talked about his illness. He made no secret of anything. He dealt with it in a range of ways. He suffered with it explicitly, overtly, and tragically, he lost a, a horrific battle with cancer. He represents a different kind of model of, of how we can be human beings who are also analysts in this world. Today our patients are far freer to name the elephant in the room and we're more committed to addressing what's going on between us. But I'm not sure that our capacity to confront the acute has much improved our engagement with ordinary aging, with its quieter iterations. I'm aware that I can forget what I came into the room looking for, forget whether I've told someone something already or not. I can fail to record a payment or record one incorrectly. I've always been a bit forgetful in these ways, but I suspect that I forget more often now, or even if not, I get more anxious about it when I do. I try to preemptively manage my anxiety by owning my mistakes, 
sometimes joking about the effects of memory, of aging on memory. My supervisees and patients smile and say little. They too are invested in preserving my intactness. So how does all this play out in a group context? I don't do group therapy, but I do run supervision, study, and writing groups. And a piece of that work also involves addressing group process, albeit in a more circumscribed way than you do in ongoing group therapy. Still, I've learned enough about group dynamics to be aware that, like most issues, the analyst's aging will pretty inevitably evoke complex responses in a group. I wish I could offer you group therapy material that emerged in response to a therapist's aging. I don't have any of my own, but with his permission, I'm stealing a vignette from Rob Pepper's recent book, Some People Don't Want What They Say They Want, that illustrates just this. In a chapter describing how patient's history emerges in a group context, he tells us about his group's response after a session in which he had the flu but worked anyway. This is all one long quote. Richard said, I was afraid you died. Half jokingly I asked, was that a wish or a fear? Frederica said, I was so worried about you, you were really quite ill last week. My reply was that famous Freud quote who had a similar reaction when his students, from his students after he returned to school following an illness. Quote, your death wishes haven't killed me yet. Okay, notice this is all denial, right? This is good jokey denial. Then Christine said, I'd like to talk. I'm very upset about a phone call I got today from a friend. He told me that her group therapist died suddenly. I felt bad for her, but then I thought about myself. Turning to me, she said, what if you died suddenly? How would we know? What would become of the group? Her question made me very anxious. My mind raced out of the room and I remembered that I had put off signing up for a workshop at an upcoming group therapy conference on creating a professional will. Unsurprising. How many people here have professional wills? Okay, less than a quarter of you. <laughs> I punted and made a lame joke. I don't have any immediate plans to die. That's the end of the quote. Negotiating how much to share and how much to respond to a group member's reaction to one's aging is enormously complicated by the fact that individual group members will react differently and with more or less intensity to their therapist's obvious aging. How do we balance individual issues and needs with those of the group? And how do we manage our own sense of exposure in the group context? It's always been tough for us therapists to hold our vitality in tension with our growing vulnerability, but perhaps never more than when we're confronting something irreversible. Will we have the guts to acknowledge that we're deteriorating? Will we find the courage to affirm our patient's concerns or will we offer reassurance? I'm fine, what's embedded in your anxiety? Do you worry that I'll leave you prematurely like your mother or father did? Is there a part of you that's waiting for me to go? Not dealing with reality. In a recent essay on views of retirement among psychodynamically oriented psychiatrists, Ingram and Stein describe how reluctantly many respond to the prospect. Being asked, quote, are you still working? Feels insulting, ageist, a negation of our capacity. I feel this acutely. I barely restrain myself from snapping back when people, often when I'm picking up one of my, my grandson at school, look at me and say, and what did you used to do, dear? <laughs> <laughs> Many of us therapists avoid thinking seriously about retirement and its meanings to us. Many of us are so deeply identified with our work that losing it feels like a loss of self. Indeed, many of us declare that we'll work till we die. We sidestep the possibility that we might be forced to stop because we're ill or incapacitated. When infirmity of one kind or another precludes our continuing to do analytic work, we have no choice but to accept the loss of our working selves along with the loss of our patients. But who are we if not analysts? 
The interpenetration of the personal and professional makes the loss of this career particularly painful and emotionally destabilizing, I think. In this respect, we're quite unlike, for example, my lawyer patients and friends who, to a person, say they can't wait to leave their jobs. Most of us therapists cannot fathom that we might want to retire to do something different with our lives. Even when we deliberately and thoughtfully choose to retire and try to prepare our patients for termination, this kind of leave taking can feel like a relational more than a personal act. We may experience ourselves as destructively selfish, abandoning or abandoned. After all, we are quite literally not replaceable. Of course, our patients aren't replaceable either. Closing a practice means losing multiple intimate connections. And even if there's relief at finally being free of the burden of a rigidly, rigidly scheduled life, and or of ongoing responsibility for the other, a sense of loss, grief, and guilt may coexist and be exacerbated by that relief. What makes it so hard for us to leave this work? Is it, be, is it that being a therapist is especially compelling because it offers us something we rarely find outside the field, a kind of intimacy that's at once rich, satisfying, and yet protected by its asymmetry in a way that non-analytic relationships are not? Whatever the particulars of our reason for not retiring, the shadow of mortality hangs over that choice. I think this is true at every transitional life stage, but it packs a particular punch when aging drives it. Erwin Hoffman, Marty Fromer, Dick Chesick, and Nancy McWilliams have all addressed our and our patients' vulnerability to omnipotent denial. Nancy McWilliams movingly acknowledges our difficulty contending with mortality and also underscores the potential upside to aging. Marty Nass addresses our denial directly and challenges us to retire preemptively. But very few of us take him up on that challenge. I suspect that this avoidance reflects both denial and the profound investment and satisfaction that we derive from this work. But either way, not thinking about retirement has a downside. It obscures, often forecloses, our need to think and plan. We don't seriously consider what else we might want to do or be able to do. Yes, many of us take more time off, but it's time off. It's not a different life. Denial of aging can also affect us on a practical level. It's not uncommon for us therapists to enter old age without the savings that would allow us to retire. We work because we need the income, and in part, this need reflects our failure to plan for the future. I suspect there's some omnipotent denial lurking beneath this failure. To further complicate things, our patients inevitably have all kinds of intense feelings about our announced retirement, especially perhaps when it's not forced upon us by illness. We're alive, we may even be quite well, but for our former patient, there's no going back. Further, retirement is not something that we arrive at intersubjectively with our patients. We alone decide. Perhaps more often, though, we retire because we're ill and or cognitively impaired. In these instances, we're unlikely to have the wherewithal to fully acknowledge, much less explore, our patient's response to our retirement. My father was a psychoanalyst. So was my mother. <laughs> I'm standing. <laughs> In his mid-80s, he suffered several TIAs and some degree of cognitive impairment. I don't know how or when most of his patients ended treatment with him or he with them, but I know that one did not because shortly after my dad's death, a man phoned me and asked to meet with me, having been sent my way by a caretaker of my dad's. The former patient and I spoke at some length. When I asked him whether he had realized that my father's functioning was compromised, he said that he had, and probably in response to my surprised look, added 
that being with him was, quote, nevertheless a real comfort. He also indicated that my father had not addressed his failing health with him. I wonder whether my father contemplated sending this man elsewhere. Did he consciously choose to continue the treatment out of awareness of this vulnerable patient's need to maintain that relationship? Out of his own need for the contact, the feeling of usefulness. I imagine that both derived comfort from this old connection, from being together. On one level, this was a mutual collusion, a denial of reality and an ethical breach. But on a human level, perhaps not only a bad thing. How do we know when to retire? Is there an age when we should disqualify ourselves altogether, even if we're well? When, for example, does minor forgetfulness bleed beyond tolerable borders? And what do we do about our patients' own need not to see how old we are? Should we allow them to maintain an illusion of our invulnerability or alert them to our deterioration, to a chronic illness, simply to the fact that we're getting old? On one level, this is all way too concrete. After all, age is hardly perfectly correlated with either death or deterioration. Some of us age really well. I have a 97-year-old analyst friend. I'm advertising her name. It's Ruth Gruenthal. She not only still practices, but at this very moment, she is skiing at Vail. Expert slopes. <laughs> she gives me hope. But on the other side, young analysts get ill and die too, and freak accidents threaten us all. I think with horror of Jeremy Saffron's tragic ending. Um, I don't know if you know who he was. He was brutally murdered in his home in Brooklyn by, we, we still don't know by whom. And of the life-threatening illness that my dear friend and colleague Lou Aaron fought until just yesterday. We lost him far too soon. He was 66. Our theory and our aging selves. It's a platitude and a sometimes truth that with age and time come wisdom and skill. Despite Winnicott's warning that sometimes the new analyst, like the new mother, does a better job because she allows the patient to communicate what's needed before acting on her accrued knowledge, it's also true that experience counts a lot. Our clinical wisdom helps us become better analysts to our patients as we age. That aging and time affect clinical skill certainly is self-evident, but less so is how and if it affects how we practice and how we think about what we do. Do we shift our theory or alter our adherence to it as we grow older? Do we become less theoretically rigid or more so? Not wanting to lean too heavily on what's autobiographical, I spoke to 21 of my older colleagues and asked them how they see their clinical theory and use of it to have changed, if at all. There was broad consensus about the fact that we're better analysts and therapists now than we were. We've been around the block. We're far more skilled, we are wiser, have better timing, more emotional resilience than we did in earlier years. We're more comfortable with our intuitive knowing because it's backed by decades of experience. We don't need to find theory before we move clinically because theory is in our bones. All this usually but not always, makes us better therapists. We also all recognize that aging can bring with it a different kind of maturity linked to an intensified awareness of time and endings. We're more cognizant of life's limits, the actuality of lost opportunities, the inevitability of death in a way that we were not in our 40s. All this is good and not. On one hand, it helps us help people with their own existential anxieties, with the threat or reality of illness, aging, and dying, if we can deal with our own fears. But it's also likely that our own existential anxieties are going to be activated along with our patients. 
for those whose personal ghosts have been undermourned and underprocessed, aging intensifies their presence. Awareness of lost opportunities, envy of younger patients and colleagues, regret in its many forms can foreclose a sense of generativity. We become preoccupied with our past and frightened of our future. These kinds of preoccupations can affect our clinical work in worrisome ways. Some of us burn out, become bitter or deeply regretful about our failures and losses. We go through the motions of being an analyst. We stop attending to clinical clues, to our patients' responses to us. We avoid thinking about how our aging, planned or unplanned retirement, affects them. Others create a barrier against these kinds of regrets by using their patients in an attempt to en enliven themselves and preserve a sense of worth. We invite our patients to affirm our aliveness as a wedge against anticipated loss. In the process, we exploit them emotionally. Even for those of us who have mostly turned our ghosts into ancestors, that's Lowald, reality bites. It forces us to face the fact that we do not have all the time in the world. This reality disrupts the illusion that analysis is a sanctuary from life. And without that sanctuary element, we really are up against it, up against what we half thought would never happen to us. There's a, there's a Peter, Paul, and Mary song with a line, we never thought we would get very old. And I think this is true even for those of us who evade despair and remain self-reflective. A new kind of porousness disrupts the illusion that previously buffered existential anxieties. It's an illusion that our patients often help support because transference factors shape their experience of us as robust and, at best, middle-aged. And even if we are seen as elderly, it's easy enough to chalk that up to our patients' projections rather than to reality. Beyond the personal, aging often informs what we actually do in the clinical moment. While some of us keep getting better at it, more intuitive, wiser, more able to use ourselves in the moment, others rigidify, live by old shoulds as a way of surviving analytically. They stick to the rules as a way of holding on for dear life. Perhaps most often, though, we let go of rules and get too loose. Therapeutic self-confidence forecloses therapeutic self-reflectivity. We don't often question what we're doing or why. We feel we don't need supervision or peer consultation. We stop pausing much before we self-disclose. We talk too much about ourselves and we're less likely to pay close attention to the impact of those self-disclosures on our patients. I'm talking about a kind of looseness that's not merely embedded in our theory or commitment to intersubjective engagement. It's a looseness that emerges out of a kind of disengagement from an earlier sense of therapeutic discipline, perhaps also self-indulgence. Both may in part reflect our intensified longing for contact, a longing informed by our awareness of the ticking clock. The loss of a sense of timelessness also alters our perspective on analytic process. On one level, aging can activate a quality of urgency in us. Some of us find it increasingly difficult to dwell comfortably in protected analytic space, to tolerate the slowness of the work. We want to help people change now, before it's too late, before we're gone. We worry about our patient's denial, about the regret they'll feel when time and death end things. This worry can lend a palpable urgency to our clinical work. We're moved to engage more deeply and to push harder. But aging pulls others toward more equanimity about the slowness of analytic process. A longer view helps us accept the limits of people's capacity to change and leaves us more content with subtle movement. We become less ambitious about what we aim to achieve and feel less impatient when change seems glacial. Most of, our, my, most of my colleagues noted that the two threads of urgency and equanimity, while omnipresent, 
affect them differently depending on the particulars of each treatment situation. However aging affects us in the consulting room, there was wide agreement that aging activates a sense of urgency in our personal lives. We begin to privilege our own desires a bit more. It's now or never. The day is gonna come when we won't be able to undertake that arduous trip we've been planning forever. Most of us feel less willing to take on patients whose needs bleed into evenings and weekends. Many of us take more vacation than ever. We stop working Fridays, for example. Some of us move away from three and four times weekly analysis, working at lower frequencies in order to get more freedom, literal and emotional. But others feel energized by the affective aliveness of more intense work and seek it out. Whether aging insulates us emotionally or activates our sense of vulnerability, it shifts our relationship to an awareness of our own needs as they collide with our patients. The unconscious becomes less timeless. The desire and fear it contains break into our awareness. This can manifest in different ways, but often leaves more of us informing the clinical and personal choices we make. Aging also shifts our self-experience in the clinical moment, though in variegated ways. One colleague sees herself to be in a kind of existential place, a bit removed from the emotional pressures that used to feel quite intense to her. She thinks she's less susceptible to the attacks leveled at her by her borderline patients, and she thinks this makes her a better analyst. But another colleague feels more vulnerable than ever and is ever less able or willing to tolerate work that can destabilize her. He refers very disturbed people elsewhere. A third see sees time as having matured him. He's less likely to go on what he called the interpretive offensive. Awareness of his aging leaves him feeling that they and he are like subjects with whom he can identify. Often, of course, our patients age along with us. A colleague notes that work with his oldest patients frequently focuses on shared existential anxieties, the reality of losing ground, of illness, loss, and death. He remarked in passing that the kind of, of wisdom his patients need from him is not to be found in our psychoanalytic canon. And I agree. Along with maturity can come a shift in the identifications that are evoked in us. In earlier years, when a patient described her parents as remote, withholding, or hostile, my instinct was to empathize with that description rather than to challenge it overtly or privately. No longer, at least not, off, at least not reflexively. Now my identification tends to go the other way, toward the patient's parents and sometimes their grandparents. I have a somewhat irritable reaction to clinical pre presentations that provide one-word descriptions of a patient's parent as, for example, narcissistic or cold. I'm reacting to the stereotype. It's usually the mother, by the way. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> I'm reacting to the stereotype, to the oh-so-easy one-off dismissal of parental subjectivity. I'm also being differently defensive. It's so much easier for me to get the parental side, to feel the immaturity of the grown-up child, her insensitivity to her parents. Yes, like my grown-up children at times, including now. <laughs> Long conversation about Passover is driving that statement. <laughs> And so, when my 47-year-old patient bitterly complains that his 80-year-old mother made, quote, the outrageous demand that I drive the family down to visit her in South Jersey rather than having come, her come to visit us, unquote, I feel both mildly alarmed and mildly judgmental. I want to address his conflicted negation of their attachment and of his mother's vulnerability not merely because his defensiveness forecloses much that he feels. I'm also acutely aware that time is running out for her and for them. I want to help him repair his relationship to his mother before it's too late. 
Losing the sanctuary element can move me away from a focus on dynamics and toward a focus on reality. When my 75-year-old patient talks about his awareness that this next overseas trip may be his last, that he can't count on remaining intact, I don't have even a momentary wish to interpret his awareness as defensive or anxiety-driven. I say simply, I know. How does our theory age? It's not only we who have aged. Psychoanalytic theory has well. I bet group theory has too. It's more complex, more flexible, less authoritarian. It explicitly addresses the intersubjective element. I think this is true whatever the particulars of our specific theoretical identification. In part, these theoretical shifts have contributed to the shifts we ourselves make as we age. With time, we metabolize aspects of our clinical position. As it becomes ours, we move away from a reflexive reliance on it <clears throat> and shape an implicit theory of therapeutic action that's more procedural than deliberate and often more flexible. Like most of my colleagues, I've stopped consulting my analytic superego about what I can, can and can't say or do, about answering questions and the like. This often means that I've loosened up, I'm less rule-bound, but I'm also more comfortable and less conflicted about drawing what feels like a necessary line. Yes, these shifts mirror the socio-cultural, personal, and psychoanalytic sea change away from authoritarianism and toward what Lou Aaron calls asymmetrical mutuality, but they also reflect clinical experience and maturity often, though not necessarily, correlated with aging. As a young psychoanalyst, I fell in love with Winnicott's vision of therapeutic repair and the feminist endorsement of maternal subjectivity. I responded to the collision between these two perspectives by reconceiving the concept of Winnicottian holding within relational theory. We can retain contact with our subjectivity but do our best to bracket it as we support our patient's access to interior experience. In many ways, I stand behind this vision. It makes room, I think, for my patient's affective resilience or vulnerability over an insistently relational, confrontational, or interpretive stance. It emphasizes making space, allowing inter interior process to develop in its own way and in its own time. It allows me to be myself while priv privileging what my patient needs. But as I've aged, I've also shifted a bit away from this theoretical tilt. That shift has been both, both procedural and theoretical. Here's the procedural part. My fairly classical and object relational analytic training left me a somewhat rule-bound, anxious young analyst, and it took several decades, more analysis, and lots of clinical experience before I got over much of that. But my thinking has shifted as well. I've become less enamored of my own theory of holding. I'm more aware of the ways that holding and intersubjectivity interpenetrate. And time has, to some extent, eroded my willingness to ongoingly bracket my subjectivity. I've also become more cognizant of and cautious about the potential underbelly to four times weekly analysis and regression to dependence as therapeutic linchpins. Certainly, holding and regression allow some patients to refine and rework early trauma in an analytic context that repairs. All this can be a good, indeed a crucial thing, therapeutically speaking. But regression has an underbelly. My regressed patient has something, sometimes a lot, to lose in the present. Her job, relationship, sense of intactness may be on the line. And I'm not referring to what Balin called malignant regression. I'm suggesting that even a needed regression puts immense strain on my patient and, yes, also on me. This awareness has moved me away from a therapeutic vision that uniquely privileges the mutative effect of relational repair. Today, I think more than I did about helping my patient develop her own capacities for doing and for affect regulation, that is, her resilience. Perhaps embedded here is my awareness that I won't be around forever. 
I wonder whether there's a generality to be made here. Do most of us become more theoretically flexible over time? Do we move away from a, a belief in our therapeutic efficacy and toward a focus on helping our patients develop more resilience? Or do some of us move the other way, toward a fuller embrace of their own emotional power as a wedge against a sense of diminishment? I suspect there's evidence for both threads, depending on a range of personal dynamic factors. Here's what I do think is usually true. Over time, that is, as we age, we tend to shift our relationship to the theory on which we've relied. While some of us entirely abandon or rewrite our theory, more often we both complicate it and loosen our attachment to it. It's easier for us to allow multiple theoretical narratives to coexist because we no longer feel the need to choose or pledge allegiance. It's impossible to parse the role of time, aging, changes in the psychoanalytic sensibility of our cohort, and clinical experience in this shift. There's not much literature on how our clinical theory changes over time, and certainly the perspective of 21 clinicians is an inadequate sample. I offer you these thoughts today in an attempt to get you to think about the question, if you're old and if you're not because hopefully one day you will be. Wow. <laughs>